All right, there we go. Gotcha. All right. Yeah, it's a beautiful, sunny day in Bogota. Just saying that. Did you get a haircut before you left? I did. I got a haircut just for the live stream. Yeah. <laughs> it looks really good. Yeah. Um, just trying to keep it together. You know what I mean? Just trying to keep it together. Do you um do you want to kick things off? Do you want to say you want to introduce me? Then I'll introduce myself. <laughs> so, Sam, how about you you introduce me, and then I'm going to introduce myself. How's that? Yeah. Okay. Good. Yep. It's a little hard hearing you, DJ. So I have to concentrate a little bit. Uh, Hey, so everybody, this is the DJ who I spoke about on Tuesday, who is the assistant director at World in Conversation and was a student in Social 119. Uh, I don't, when was that, DJ? I think 2006 or seven. 2006. Okay. So is, um, just has a lot of experience with uh, Native American culture, which she's going to talk about today, and, and I will chime in and talk about it as well. And so, DJ is um, uh, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna say this about DJ, okay? I'm gonna I have to say this, DJ, so people understand. So I have thousands and thousands and thousands of students who go through my life year after year for the past 34 years. DJ is the only human being I've ever sat down with and said, please stay at Penn State and keep working with me because we have a lot of really important work to do. Yeah, and she did. So of the tens, probably 30,000 people, she is the only one ever asked to stay. So thanks for doing that, DJ, and thanks for coming to class. <laughs> thanks. Um, Sam, thank you for- And welcome. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> um, and thank you, Sam, for doing this with me. So you guys have may have heard about this lecture before, talking about Native Americans and indigenous peoples. Um, but this is going to be the first year that Sam and I do this together. And he's going to be doing it from Colombia because we're wanting to tie a few subjects together that we haven't done before. So thanks for uh, teaming up with me, too. So really quick, let me just say a couple things about myself before we go on. So again, my name's Dana Jane Mahaliano Sabalias, DJ. Um, and I've been here at Penn State. I did my undergrad and then my master's here. And then um, I not only work with Dr. Sam Richards and his wife at World in Conversation, Dr. Lori Mulvey, but the other very, very um, passionate work that I do at Penn State is that I'm one of the instructors for this course called Indigenous Ways of Knowing. And that class is what has propelled me to be very connected, interested, and find a lot of um, learning through going up to the reservation every year. So this year, by the way, the class is postponed, but we're going to pick up next year. Um, and I got started in that class actually because of Sam. Uh, when I first started working with him back in like 2008, he said, hey, to a couple of staff members, we're looking for a TA for this class that goes up to the reservation. But if you go, this is going to change your life. And I kind of took that for granted, um, but it has. It's changed my life a lot. So I'm actually Filipino and Lebanese. And as a Filipino and, you know, first generation, my mom, you know, was born in the Philippines and came here in the 80s. Um, I got a chance to explore how being Filipino and being actually Ita, which is indigenous to the Philippines, what that meant for me and how I felt going through college and maybe even going through some identity crisis. So even if you're not a person of color or have a background in some kind of like, a, I don't know, difference in ethnicity, we're at this age in college where you're going through forming your identity and getting to be part of that class just helped me explore particularly what it meant for me to be indigenous. And a quick way I can tell you what that means right now is that when you're indigenous, it just means you have a very 
prominent understanding that you're of the land. I'm going to use the word native. I might say the word Native American. I might say the word Indian later on, okay? And we can talk about what's offensive and not offensive later. But for me, indigeneity is something now that I'm proud and I haven't been able to say a few years ago. So with that, Sam, let's go ahead and go to the next slide and get right into the maps. Oh. Well, yeah, I have to say this. The other reason, it, it sounds like a really small reason, but I guess the other reason why I've been propelled to do this work and have these dialogues um, is because of my husband. Um, I think Sam mentioned him in last class too, Chaplain Bailey. Uh, he's a Native person who I happened to meet at a sweat lodge ceremony. By the way, that Penn State class I keep mentioning, it's award-winning and really unique because the students who go, even though you're outsiders, Literally, right? You're outsiders going into a community, into reservation territory, one of the only two closed reservations um, in this country right now. You get invited and get to be part of daily life. For example, ceremonies aren't put on for Penn State students. Penn State students participate in ceremonies. And in one of those ceremonies, I met my husband who um, we're now having a baby. So, <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know if it's a boy or girl yet. We'll see. <laughs> so that being said, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but um, we need to give some background. So Sam, I'm going to turn it over to you for the first couple of slides, and then we're going to keep rolling. Okay. All right. Very good. Hey, let me know. I can't know if there are any audio issues with me, so I'll just talk. And Jeff, I'll try to hold my phone as, as still as I possibly can. Okay, so if you look at this map, this is one of the earliest maps of North America that was ever made. And this was back in the early 1600s. And if you notice, you, you see all the, the colonies and the small towns and just how they started to emerge up and down the eastern and southern seaboard. And then, of course, you can see Mexico and going into Central America. And right, you know, you kind of see the edge of Colombia, where I am right now. But notice all the blank white space there. And there's this sense that we have being kind of raised and thinking about cartography and geography from a North American perspective, that this was empty land when the Europeans arrived. All of this was empty land that nobody had designated certain areas to be uh, the land of certain groups and certain tribes. But in fact, all of that land was uh, land that was, had been, I would say, cultivated and claimed and uh, been, was the homeland for thousands of uh, peoples, groups of people, groupings of people, uh, for many, many thousands of years. And so this is what just the United States would look like. If we, if it were, you know, if we could go back and mind you, there are many, many tribes within those. Those are the general territories. But the U.S., the U.S., what is now the United States, was not empty land, and that's the story, of course, that the Americans tell, right? And it's the story that we have to tell, um, in a way, right? Because you can't tell the story to children that, well, your, you know, your ancestors came to this land and took it from somebody else. Um, and that's just not a story that anybody tells of themselves. It's not just the United States. Uh, it's everywhere in the world where there's been, there are certain groups of people have been pushed out. There's always a story, a history that's, that really uh, civilizes, I should say to use that word, what actually happened, there has to be. So um, there's, it's just like glass class, you know, trying to say there's nothing uniquely special good or bad about the the united states and the kinds of things that we do um it's just kind of common stuff all around the world so, so um so maybe dj can you say something about how indigenous peoples yeah so so you guys are following right sam is talking about how this is the story we're all taught we're all familiar this is settled territory. You can't really see it, but all these little tiny words here are all the colonies. And we're taught that the Ohio River Valley right in the center is this open territory, 
right? Because we don't often share this map in schools. So if you look, you're able to see what are the names of the tribes in the areas of the U, what we call the U.S. right now, right? And I know you see this line right here, but that line doesn't actually exist when you think about indigenous peoples. Like, for example, the Ojibwe people who we spend most of our time with at this Penn State course and who I have a lot of connection with are the largest Native American tribe in North America, right? M many of you probably even haven't heard of the Ojibwe, but they're huge because it's not actually just territory right here in the northern part of the states. Their territories go into Canada. And that's why they're the largest Native American tribe here in this region of the world, right? But we, like Sam said, we don't tell our children that. Or maybe we do, but in a subtle way. We don't necessarily talk about this next slide. Sam, do you want to say what this 50, 56 million means? Yeah, so it's estimated that in the Americas, North America, which again is Canada and Mexico, Central America. Turn your Wi-Fi off. off, please. Wait. Okay. Uh, so... We're good, right? I, I keep going? Thumbs up? Yep, thumbs up. Okay, all right, man. So um, it's estimated that in the, the you know, the, the Spanish arrived in, you know, 1490s, and in the subsequent 100 years, it's estimated that a, a little over 50 million indigenous peoples were killed or died. Some were killed, some died of, of uh, diseases that were brought by people for whom they didn't have any uh, effective immune, an immune system for those diseases. And 56 million, mind you, it may not seem, I mean, obviously it's a lot of people, but at the time, because the world's population was so much smaller, it was probably about 10 to 20% of the entire population of the world. Maybe someone could jump on their phone and take a look at what the world's population was in, you know, 1500. But, uh, but that's a lot of people. And, this is the largest, most the, the the longest lasting, most extensive genocide, both cultural and physical, in all of human history. There's nothing that comes close to it, and and it happened right here in the Americas, you know, in this place. And much of that happened here in North America, you know, all of this land, everything, the land that the classroom is on. It, it, those of you who have families in the Americas and you own homes, all of that land is land that was taken from somebody else. And so, you know, it, it just becomes something that's really, really important to be thinking about. All right, BJ, I'll let you go now. Okay, go. so I'm picking up on all of this land was land that was owned, owned, inhabited by somebody else. And we are today moving forward from the one of the largest genocides that have happened in human history, right? One of the largest genocides ever is on the land that we're occupying right now. So one thing to think about is when we think about, okay, Native people, how do they feel? Fast forward to today because Native people aren't extinct as much as there were many, many, many efforts to kill off native peoples, they are not extinct from this continent or this territory, right? How do native people think about immigration? How do you think native people today think about the lines that are dividing countries when these lines weren't the same for native peoples? Because right? we have a very different way of thinking about land, which I'm going to go a little bit more into. Well, I'll just say this right now. We have a very different way as indigenous people of thinking about land because we really understand that you're from the land. And it's not that there's a God or something in the land. It's just knowing that we came from the earth and when we die, we're going to go back to the earth. Native people, Indians, Native Americans, they're monotheistic. That means they believe in one God. 
A lot of you might even think that native people are like worshiping gods or something like that. No, no, no. They're monotheistic. They believe in the creator and they just have a divine understanding philosophically, scientifically, and spiritually that we are of this earth. That's it. Philosophically, scientifically, we understand that we're of this earth and we're, com- we're from a specific local, specific land base. Hey, so DJ, let me jump in here really fast. Okay. So, so what that means then is God is the earth, right? I mean, like, what does that no, no, mean? No, I, wouldn't, Can I, you... wouldn't, I wouldn't say that God is the earth. It's just the belief that if there is God to be found, and in indigenous beliefs, like everyone has their own red road, everyone has their own journey, right? Very personal, your own spirituality. If there is God to be found, it is found in nature. That's it. If there's God to be found, it's found in nature. And that's why we have to respect the earth. Did you want to, did you want to reply to that, Sam? So that means when you, when we think about stealing land, we think from a native perspective that their land was stolen, stolen, their, their gods were killed the gods were so everything was taken right like it's not you don't just take land you take everything yeah right yeah you're taking you're taking the base in which you gain knowledge you're taking your relations you're not taking property right when land is taken and you you really understand that you are connected to this land it's like it's like going up to somebody and saying, I don't know, I need someone from like the end here to look up at me. Can I, can you, I just, okay. It's like going up, right? This is what happens when land is getting taken over for indigenous peoples. It's like taking this air and see this square of air that I'm now drawing a line around. Um, I'm gonna take that air from you. How do you feel about that? Bad. Well, no, actually, no, it actually feels like ridiculous. Like, you can't take the air from me. No, no, no. But what happened is Native people are thinking you can't do that. You can't just own the Earth Mother like that. But that's what happened. I literally now in, you know, as a colonizer, as a developer, have been able to draw a line around this air around you and called that my property. And I'm going to sell that to her over here. That's what happened. And so if you're a native person, it's not that you're dumb and you don't understand what property is. It's just that this is a very different concept, very different way of approaching what it is we know as property, what it is we know as the earth, what it is we know as the mother, and how we experience science even. Does that make sense? Are you guys following me? Sort of? I hope so. <laughs> so, uh, well, I have one though. So. When I think about the history of Europeans fighting each other and fighting for land, and I think about all of the transitions that have happened in the past, even just in the past century with Prussia and one thing after another, they're fighting for land, literally, just the land. And, and so we in the West, we think about that in a very different way. And so the way you're talking, it's, you just see the, the absolute, like the, the tragedy, you know? And so like, Bodies are buried on that land. Your ancestors are there. They still live there. Can you say something about that? Like all of this land that, where the ancestors are. Yeah, I wish I still had this image. On, I don't think we have this on the side. So, um, oh, let me just jump to this really quick. And then, Elena, we're going to invite you up. So, do you guys uh, remember the, all the pipeline protests that were going on? And there was this conversation about, or these banners and riots about defending the sacred, right? This isn't, um, for a lot of people who were part of that movement, it's not about, again, defending property against corporate government and um, business owners and competing for um, dollars, per se. Defending the sacred is literally because since we're connected to this earth, and since my ancestors live here, since my grandparents are, are, are living here and their bodies have been buried here, 
There's something here that I have to defend when part of the construction includes literally excavating the graveyards where my family is supposed to rest in peace. That's what happened. That's what happened for at least the local people in the area uh, in northern Minnesota. Most recently, they were doing actions again, Pipeline 3. But that that's what hurts. It's not because it's about fighting the corporation. It's about defending the Earth Mother for everyone, not just Native people, and also wanting our ancestors to rest in peace. There were, there were sacred sites. Sacred sites don't always fall within reservation territory. They can fall. Oh, man, that's a whole nother story. But look, all I'm saying is defending the sacred meant defending part of who you are and the right for my family to rest in peace. Just imagine, really, just so, ima go ahead, Sam. So DJ, go to the next two slides. I think if you show those slides, it's really mm. powerful. Just, the, just how abhorrent that is. You know, if that's, if that's sacred to you, and that's, that is, that's the creator, that's the spirit lives in there, your ancestors are there, that's part of you. Imagine the trauma of these, seeing that. And for us, we just say, you know, the earth is just, it's a resource to be exploited. Just tear it open and get the oil out and cover it back up and build some pipelines and build roads and do whatever you want to do. But that's just not how indigenous peoples around the world see the earth. Sometimes there was this argument during the pipeline where people would say, oh, but don't worry about it. Don't be fighting for it because, look, the pipeline route doesn't actually hit these green reservation territories. But wait, all, all of the earth is our land. All of the land is the earth, and we're responsible for taking care of it. There's this teaching. It's called the seven generations teaching that every decision you make you have to think about seven generations after you and the seven generations that came before you. So even in doing business and development work, indigenous people, that's one of the questions they cycle through. What's the longevity? What's the longer term impact of this business plan we're creating? It's, it's just a different mindset. So speaking of my, Sam, I'm thinking about board. Oh, you're muted again or something. Yeah, no, listen, I hit it. Accident. So listen, I want to think about how difficult it is sometimes for West. In my experience in working with indigenous peoples, how difficult, difficult it has been with my mindset as a Westerner, which is kind of goal oriented, cause effect. Let's just get something done. Let's come up with a plan and let's follow it and how Native peoples, with what you just said, the seven generations before and after, sometimes it just takes forever to just feel one's way through what is the right decision. It's not just a simple cause effect thing or, or just, um, just like it's not built on logic, it's built on the spirit. Everything is about the spirit. And I think, well, we probably could use a little dose of that in a lot of our decision making, you know, so. Yeah, it makes me think about another example where we can talk about the differences in mindset, differences in business or the differences in spirituality and philosophy is talking about immigration. Sam, are you ready to yep. go there? And yeah, wait, so Sam. Yep. Hold on, yep. there's a question from the stream and it asked, should we stop all economic development Especially if all land is sacred, how do we judge when it is okay to drill for oil, cut down trees, etc.? Yeah, that's a really good question. So can I, I'm just going to answer. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Please do. Okay, so the question is about, so should we be stopping economic development? If economic development always equals drilling for oil, cutting down trees, and I don't know, just excavating the land. No, no, no. 
Native people are also, you have to understand that traditional knowledge just mean that it's knowledge that's been passed down and time tested. That means Native people are actually very adaptive and innovative. And so we do believe in science and we do believe in innovation. It's just that in your business plan or when you're thinking about how to develop, you have to think about how am I also restoring? So when, I, when we cut down all these trees to build this building, what's gonna be the environmental impact if you wanna use that word? And how is it gonna affect the local people? We just have to think a little bit more holistically every time decisions are made. And therefore- and, and, no, and, no, go ahead, and therefore well, what? And therefore decisions, and when it comes to development, just take a little bit more time than what you see in the culture we're all growing up in right now. The time, the way we treat time is just different. Go ahead, Sam. Yeah, so I'm thinking that um, it doesn't mean you stop it. And I, and I think this is really, really important for all of us. A lot of times we turn these the gray area issues into black and white responses. Mm -hmm. So the question, a question would be, okay, well, if this is how Native Americans operate and if they got what they want, so should we just stop everything and stop all growth? No, no, no. It's just stay in the gray area. You know, it's like last class, I was talking about all this stuff that happens in the name of the United States all around the world. And None of us are going to change foreign policy. It's just be better than what we are. And so imagine the ways in which we could live more dynamic and fascinating and interesting and spiritually whole lives, not to mention emotionally and sociologically and psychologically, but spiritually whole lives. If we just took into account how our decisions would impact, I don't know, people even a year from now, let alone seven generations. So it's just cool. It's a really, it's a really fascinating way to think about life. It's a cool way to think about life. It's not the only way. It's just, you know, we're in college to grow and we're in college to change our thinking about things, just to think, just to understand different ways to think about things and then make choices about what's best for us. So this is just one opportunity to do that. So look, I want to give you one more thought experiment and then what we're going to do is move on from showing differences between the, the different mindsets or the different ways to approach things, being indigenous or non-indigenous. And then I want to show you guys how come, I don't, how come you may not already know this? Because I know all of you in here can raise your hands and say, I've already learned about the Trail of Tears. I had a good history teacher that taught me about Native Americans and so forth. But there's something about, I guarantee there's something about a few things that we just described that you don't know yet. For example, no, we don't mean stop economic development. We just think about it differently. Can we mute a little bit, Sam? So, okay. All right. That's good. No, that's good. Um, so really quick, the, the, yes. oh, what were you going to say? Hey, let's no, let's let's go to immigration exactly. quickly from a native so, perspective. And Elena, can you come yep. up here? It's it's Eliana. Eliana. Ah, so listen, class. So so after class yet the other day on Tuesday, Eliana came up and up. told told me the story of her mother, who was forced to leave Honduras. It's Honduras, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, for who, well, you tell the story, and I just say, you know, I just want to introduce the class, or, or I want you to introduce yourself to the class, so we can see that these stories are not really that far from us. I mean, here you are in, you know, the, the child of someone who is directly impacted from the kinds of things I was talking about last class, and here you are with us, studying with us. So, so um, go ahead. Thank you. Thanks for uh, being willing to share a little bit of your story. And uh, just remember, this is one of your classmates. So would you mind just sharing 
how you came to this con no share your birthing story okay. i think that's what it is it's right. your birthing story is this working okay yeah okay so um basically my mom was in honduras when she was pregnant with me and um someone had told her that she was being sent out to get killed so someone had told had her to what she was gonna get killed Pe because um just problems within our government like i don't know just she was just one of those people that were going to be killed for no reason. So she actually had to flee, and that's why we're here today. So what I feel like you're sharing is there is political and economic or political strife going on, and your mom was, your mom was informed that she was going to die, and she had new life growing in her. Right. And that's you. Yes. <laughs> And, and so she fled, mm -hmm. and she came through the border through Mexico. This is actually the picture of um, part of the wall in Mexico right now, by the way, when I was there two, two spring, yeah, I think two summers ago. Um, and that's where she came through, right? Yeah, and we were, like, really fortunate because it's not like um, we, my uncle was a, a truck driver, so we literally just drove in, like, mm -hmm. and because she was pregnant, she wasn't really questioned, but still, uh, it was always like, uh, I might die, or they might take me, like, I, I might not even be able to go to the United States and give my daughter, like, a better life, or, like, you know, so. The thing I want to highlight and pull out from this story is that not everyone comes here because they want to. In Eliana's story, it's, I don't hear you saying you're not happy to be in America, but you, you it's yeah. not like you I, we, chose we really, it. No, we don't. It's like my mom, like she doesn't fail to tell me like, I don't want to be here. I don't feel comfortable here. Like there's no place like home. Like she would love to be home and like with her people and stuff. Like this is not where we're supposed to be, you know? But she came because otherwise her life was threatened, right? And, and I think what I was pointing out last class is much much, most, much many, or probably most of the forces that were in play threatening your mother, we, the United States, had a role in creating. And so this is it. This is what happens. And so you came across the border like this little Buddha bean who's in the belly of DJ. Right? That's where you were. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, sometimes I think about, and maybe you guys can just, like, take a moment and think about this, too. What if Eliana's mom, what if she went into labor before she crossed that line? So she, they're from Honduras, and they got close to the Mexico-U.S. border. And she went into labor, but she was still on the Mexican side. Eliana would still be this DNA that we see right now, but what else would Eliana's life look like? What would be the conditions that surround her life compared to the life she has now as a Penn State student? And she would, she would be a DACA child and because she wouldn't have a passport and she would be here illegally. And she would be just as American as any other American. And yet, we have people who say would say, no, send her back to Honduras because she doesn't belong here. She's illegal. Her mother broke the law and send her back. And so you see the complexity of that. It's just so, this is why, like, these stories aren't just stories. They're not just policies. They're stories. They're real human beings. You know? It's like, it's I don't know. classmate. <laughs> Can we give her a round of applause for sharing part of her birthing story? Yeah. So we also wanted to bring up the idea of immigration because, again, these borders and these lines, that's not the same for us. It's not the same for indigenous people. This is more what, oh, wait, I think it's right there. This is more what we think about. Yep. Do you want to say what you understood? None of your brothers are illegal. No human, yeah. No human being is illegal. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's very close. 
No human being is illegal. <clears throat> so, here we go. Next, oh, is Sam uh, there? <laughs> Nope. Okay. So <laughs> he's going to be back any minute. There's me. <laughs> um, but I want to, I want to just get to this next point here. All right. So you, we get, we talked about a few differences and we talked a little bit about history and we also flipped how we think about immigration a little bit. So where are we at now? Oh, knock, knock. Hi. Okay. okay I'm back. <laughs> Hi. Hey, thanks, Ariana, for sharing. Uh, I didn't get a chance to say that. Yeah. So, you know, DJ, what do you, so you, um, tell me what Native Americans say about this illegal immigration issue. Like, who's illegal, who's not? Who's, can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, Sam, what we just got finished uh, mentioning is on this banner during this conversation, this riot, is no human is illegal. And that's how Native people will think about it, right? Because it's not to say that, it's not to say that you don't believe in having a space of your own or that you come from a specific part of a land base. It's just to say that the borders, and and there are some pretty, I, I don't know, I've met some pretty, um some elders <laughs> up on the reservation who would really talk some crap on people who think, <laughs> send those illegals back. They would say that about you all, you know? <laughs> um, but not like, I hope that's not like, it's just kind of funny because there's a way where, uh, have you, I, I think about that cartoon you shared with me, Sam, how there's a native person who's looking at people who are complaining about immigration and are saying, wait a second, but you were also an immigrant. So now you get to flip the script? Hold on, we don't we don't say that to you. Right, and the native and the native guy in the one cartoon is saying, I'll help you pack yeah. to the white people. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and listen, so, y'all, the the thing is that there's no right answer to any of this. The the point is what I always say is just please have some respect when making these kinds of of arguments, but because when you, every time you talk about illegal aliens, you really gotta imagine a mirror right in front of you, because from the perspective of uh, many people in the United States who are indigenous to the land, being the first occupiers, the first peoples, um, you, you too are illegal. And even though nobody is illegal, but you know what I mean. Like, yeah, it's just having a certain respect. And so nobody's going to go away. You know, I'm not, the land I'm on right now is not going to be given back to the indigenous peoples of Colombia. Penn State is never going to be given back. It's just, that's not the point. The point is having respect and trying to be thoughtful in the way we think about our arguments and our, and the things that we say. Yeah. And speaking of being thoughtful, so, what do we think about Native people today? Because a lot of the time I still run into, like I teach high school students in the summertime, and I run into high school students from Central PA who don't know that Native people are still alive. But I get that. So if you open up your phones really quick, how many federally recognized tribes are there? Can, I mean, just Google it really quick. How many federally... This is going to be tricky. Federally recognized tribes are there. What? By, okay, so there's a couple more since we last updated this. By the way, one of the most recent tribes that have been um, granted federal recognition is the Pamunkey tribe, who is now located in what we call Virginia. Oh, that's where I grew up. That's why I'm a former Redskins fan, um, So, which I'll go into. The Pamunkey tribe is the tribe that Pocahontas was from. And they just gained federal recognition from this U.S. government maybe three years ago. 
three years ago. Because what it means to be federally recognized is that you put in a, a lot of paperwork to show that you've existed in this territory for a long time. And one of the ways that you prove that you've existed is that you show that the federal government of this now here United States has went to war with your tribe. Because remember, tribes aren't just rampant running people. They are people in specific areas who have a specific government, who have their own language, who have unique culture, okay? And the federal government, and as we were colonizing this land, had to take it over somehow. And yes, you've been told stories about the rampant killing, which is part of it, but the killings were done specifically in wars with specific tribes. And so right now, this government recognizes only 573 of these tribes. And these tribes, even though they're federally recognized, only some of them occupy reservation territory, which is the spots in red. So all of this land used to be native land, but right now native people have reservation specific territory to them, meaning they are able to run their own government on those lands, have school systems on those lands, on, that re on these reservations. That's how many there are. So along with killing, by the way, right? Because war is really expensive. And I, I need to break this down to you. Hold on. I really, really, really have to break this down to you because I think one of the arguments that we've all been fed, one of the narratives we all know as Native people deserve to have their land being taken because it's kind of just like a game of war, literally the game of war. You go and you fight, and whoever is the last one standing wins. This is a fair and square game ancestors of those of you who are here and who are part of settling this territory and civilizing this territory, your ancestors would say, we won this fair and square because we fought and we won, period. That's how war works, okay? But remember, war is expensive. The U.S. spends a lot of money on the wars that we're in currently, and it's a really big debate. So. When wars are too expensive and native people still occupy this land that you need for your family, what do you do? What do you do? Just take a moment and just take a moment and check out this poster. This isn't a joke. This is just common. It wasn't even subtle the other tactics that had to be taken against Native people in this land. That Ohio River Valley area that Sam was pointing out in the beginning, oops, that's what was for sale. And it kept moving west and pushing more and more, and you know reservation territories, by the way? These reservation territories in red? Native, pe these reservation territories, they were actually much bigger. And through the years, through lots of negotiation, the federal government was, this United States federal government, made agreements where native people had to secede land or they chose to secede part of reservation territory that was originally agreed in earlier treaties to be maintained by native people, they gave it up to negotiate for more resources because the way that they lived was changing. Right? One thing that's happening, you could even find conservative people from Texas who are really upset about the development of the wall because they understand how that wall is going to affect their ecosystem. They understand how that wall is going to affect some of the animals that just migrate across this line and help in terms of developing their grassland, in terms of keeping up with a certain system that's intact on their farmland. And they don't want the wall. 
So think about that for Native people. As this world is changing, as colonizers keep moving in and developing, how you relate to the earth, how you get your food is also changing because we've now overhunted all of the beaver pellets and sent them out to Europe for commerce. So now that you don't have these beaver pellets that you also used to use for food, not just for clothing, and they've been really diminished, how else are you getting food? And when you're doing negotiations with the federal government who are saying, hey, what you live in isn't good enough, you should live in these kinds of housing structures, but they require these new materials, you're now relating to trees differently and you need new materials and you need to harvest them differently. And so you get forced into seceding land, meaning negotiating with another government to give up land. And that's part of the reason why reservation territories are this small. It's not just because people have been killed, even though that was horrible. Like I said, it was one of the largest ever in human history. It also happened between government negotiations and because people were forced into harsh conditions that the U.S. created, just like the theme we talked about last Tuesday. So can we just actually, Sam, do you want to say anything or can we just play the video? Well, I'm actually just thinking that I'm wondering if we should go to that other video, that, that I'm an Indian too. Um, well, I don't know. Okay, no, hang no. on. Let's be yeah, yeah, I think play, play the dig, play that video and then, um, and then I'll, I'll just move pretty quickly into the next one. I have a way of connecting it, I think. <laughs> you know what? Now let's, now let's see. I, I gotta feel. Do the Dave Matthews one because here's a, here's a fairly pop, you know, it's less popular now among this particular generation, but, um, you know, here's a band that's pretty well known and here's a song that was out and very few people even know what the song is about. Yeah, let me frame it really quick. So we're going to play this song for you. Sam thoughtfully put together some depictions throughout this song. And I want you to pay attention to how you feel as you watch the images change and think about the change that Native people went through in terms of what I just got finished talking about, about your land, your family, the way that you live changing that quickly. You're going to experience that in this song. So go ahead. Thanks, Jeff. So we don't often share the story about how non-natives and natives are interconnected. We talk about it like it's two separate stories. Like that's native people's history and then America has its own history. There's a way that we're interconnected though. The story that most of us know right now is this last slide. I just wanna jump here really quick, Sam. Do you, did you wanna, I just wanna say one thing. Hey. You can, go ahead. Hey. Jeff, let me. Go ahead. Okay. I can't hear. Am I still muted? I'm still muted. Yes. Yeah, go ahead, okay. Sam. I no, no, go ahead, DJ. I see that you're on this slide. I think it'd be good to say a few words about that. Yeah, so I was saying that our stories are interconnected. We don't talk about the story that way of being native and non-native in this continent, this region. But we do talk about native people's stories in this way. Like those, those like uh, scrap housing that you guys saw in the last video, it, it reflects this, right? When you think about I, native, I think it, go ahead, Sam. No, uh, I think that when I think about that song and I think about the history and I, and I sit with it, then I look at these numbers and I think about how Native peoples on so many social and economic indicators are not even 
first off, they're rarely included. And when they are included, they're, they're often not even on the scale. Yeah. Because income uh, because of income inequality and all of the issues. Um, it's so powerful to me that the, the indigenous peoples, the original peoples here in this land that is that represents for so many people around the world the place of opportunity and the one place in the world where you can go to make life better for yourself and your family. And that the indigenous peoples of this land are by far and away the people, the group that live in the most outlandishly difficult conditions, um, that, that suffer more than any other on almost every indicator. And, you know, it's, there are things like DJ, I don't, I don't want, I don't want you to go into it because I, I know what it means, but, you know, just sexual assaults on reservations and, you know, nine out of 10 of the sexual assaults are committed by white people and all the, can you go back to the slide? Can you go to that slide, DJ, with all the names that people are called? Like, just you look at these names and here, we don't use these names in Pennsylvania. Um, because there aren't reservations here in Pennsylvania where we're pushing up against. But when you go to any of these reservations and you go around the reservations, the hatred that Native Americans experience at the hands of people who live around the reservations is so profound. You look at these names. These are, these are common, commonly used names. And, and yet they're not even in our lexicon. We don't even talk about it as a society. It's just not, it's not part of it. And so you just think, don't drink the water. You know, there's blood in the water. And I, I don't, there's nothing to do about it. There's nothing any one of us can do to change things. All we can do is transform ourselves and just start to see the world differently. And then things begin to happen. It's really profound. And by the way, black people, those are for black Americans who originally did not come here willingly. Um, you know, it's also, it's a very, that's, a, it's a very complex place to be because, you know, if your ancestors came here by force, you, you know, you're, you've had to wrestle with the fact that you're also trying to now at this point, if you're at Penn State, you know, you want to get a piece of the pie, which means, you know, you want to buy land and you want to be, you know, well, you know, you're, com you're coming up against this, but it's, it's a little different for you, you know, or, you know, international students, but I would say to those of you who are not Americans, in your own land, if I, I could probably pick any of your societies and the same thing has happened, um, it just in a different way with different people. And so, you know, it's just to sit with it. Those words are just profound to me. But DJ, you've been called those words, right? When you're out on the reservation, people think you're Native American? Yeah, every time when I'm up on the reservation, it's just, it's different. It's a different world to walk into. Because um, we have the same round face. I remember one of, one of the elders telling me that, like, oh, you're Filipino, but you've got the same round face. <laughs> Um, so for you, to, so when you walk off the reservation, yeah. that's where you can experience the hatred. Yeah, and sometimes it's pretty blatant, you know. Sometimes it's language that's said, or sometimes it's stuff that my husband still faces every day at work. You know, he's a chaplain for Native people, and um, and there are colleagues of his who say these things like, "Hey, what's up, two feathers?" or "Hey, chief." And not recognizing, like, ooh, man, every time you call him chief, like, what does that do to the people who we've really chosen as chiefs? <laughs> or when people say, like, oh, you're about to go do that ceremony, so you guys going to go smoke some peyote? You're going to smoke some peyote out of your peace pipe? <laughs> man, sometimes ceremonies, those things that are really, really sacred, and where you go to pray, sometimes those have been some of the most difficult experiences I've had. And when you make jokes about, hold on, when you make jokes no, about go ahead. 
this is, it's all love. We can do this. <laughs> um, when jokes are made about sacred medicines, about the sacred pipe, about how we pray, that, that like cuts a wound somewhere, you know? So can you go back to the slide with the, the Redskins fan? Yeah. And talk about, yeah. <laughs> We have to, if we're going to talk about Native Americans, you do have to talk about the mascot issue. And, um. You take, take yeah. this for five minutes and I'll, I'll take the last five minutes of class. Okay. Yeah. So the mascot issue, I, I just like, for example, opened up really quick there, right? Showed you that like things that are made, these jokes that are said, they actually do cut some, cut somewhere in us, right? But I get why they're said. I get why they're said because we have these mascots and growing up in Washington, D.C., this is what we saw. You know, my indigenous name, the one that was uh, given to me by my, my we'e, the na my name giver, like my, the one who, I guess you could kind of equate it to a godfather. It's Chi Miguan, means sacred feather. But before I got that name and, and explored my own indigeneity, that's what I grew up seeing more often. And we make light of Native people. I wish I could show them that other video. Not only do we make light of Native people through mascots, but we make light of people through Halloween costumes. We, Jeff, could you actually just play it while I talk a little bit? Oh, you are playing it. Thank you. You guys should check this video out later, but the other way we make light of it is that all these things about Native people we think are funny because you think they're dead. <laughs> so what's happening in this video here, he's actually Native, that guy who looks white, and he has hipster written across his chest. He's also Native, but you can tell he looks Native, right? He's a real person, and so are they today. Na this is Native people today, and they're at this trade show where turquoise is being sold and silver jewelry is being sold <laughs> over in the Southwest. And some of these white people, they really love, they love that stuff. And we go to these tobacco outlets. You know, tobacco is one of our sacred medicines. And we use tobacco to put down on the earth before we take anything because we believe in reciprocity, that before you take something, you have to give. So tobacco as a sacred plant, if you, uh, those of you who farm and take care of agriculture like that, tobacco teaches you a lot. And so that plant that you harvest, you got to take it and you offer it before you, <laughs> man, sorry, I just lost my train of thought as I watched this video. But anyway, it's called I'm an Indian too. You should check it out and listen to the song behind. So what's happening here is that you can see these images of native people today but that you don't actually think of because there are all these other images of native people in these headdresses and as mascots and halloween costumes that desensitize us to actually looking at what's real what's real native people don't have to be in the regalia to be native and they don't have to be doing special sacred dances or smoking peyote <laughs> to prove their nativeness. They're just indigenous to this land. That's it. So go ahead, Sam. Wait, can I say one thing before? Sure. Um, we talked, we, we skimmed over the whole, one of the largest genocides, but I really want <laughs> you to understand what we really did. We as in Americans, Europeans, whatever. There were like, a hundred million natives here before us. And then after 300 years, there were less than 10 million. So when we think about the Holocaust, we're like, oh my God, how could the Germans do something like that? They killed six million people. And then we don't even look at our own history and our own culture and we're like, we don't even think about the land that we took. And I'm not saying, oh, well, America shouldn't have been formed and all, no. History is history and we can't do anything about it, but we have to recognize. And when you realize how many people we killed, and then we still go to Washington, we go to FedEx Field and we're like, yeah, go Redskins. What is that saying about us? 
Like, really, what is that saying about us? I also, like DJ, was a, was a Washington football team fan. And I don't even say the name anymore because it upsets me so much. I don't talk about Cleveland. I don't talk about any of those other. I don't say the names. Because even that little bit of microaggression that you do, people who always talk about microaggressions, that's a microaggression. And we have to think about that. Because if we don't, we're going to continue going to Halloween parties and people are going to be dressed up in feathers and then we're not going to say anything because it's going to be awkward and we don't want that person to be mad at us because they want us to be their friends. Thanks, That's Jeff. That. <laughs> we have to think. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. I appreciate you. Ah, it feels like he's, he's been listening to this lecture. No. <laughs> um, I've got one more thing and then Sam, but I really, you said you want to wrap, you want to tie it together, right? Yeah, so the, the last thing I want to say, because, look, um, these differences or, like, talking about this subject, the, the other part of what I do is, hold on, hold on, just stay with me. You guys are almost done, and it'll be really quick. I'm going to say one thing, and then Sam's going to wrap it up, and you have spring break. Woo! All right. <laughs> Before that, though, really quick. The other thing I do is help lead these discussion groups that you guys are all part of. And what's really funny to me is that in the discussion groups, whoa, 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 just really keep your eyes on me. Keep your eyes on me. What I notice is that this is one of the toughest subjects to talk about, and nobody touches it. Very, 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 very few discussion groups actually talk about this. So, and I know, I get why, like, because we keep saying, like, you can't do anything about history and here we are and so forth. But I guess what I just want you to wrestle with, if I can offer something to some of your discussion groups, is what am I going to tell this baby? <laughs> what, well, just really, how would you talk to this child about how we're interconnected, natives, non-natives, what, what some hopes are for collaborating in the future, how we got here. How, how would you talk to this baby about what we just talked about in class? How would you talk about it? Go ahead, Sam. Man, that's a really, that's a really intense. Thanks for that last question. Hey, I, the only thing, I'm not going to say what I was going to say. I, I don't want to go into it, but I want to show you, you know, here I am in Bogota in this park called Vida Park. And it's this most amazing park where people come and they exercise and they walk their dogs and they have playgrounds for kids and trees and Every time I walk through here, I think none of these people want to come to the United States. If you, if you live around Bureau Park, you wouldn't want to come to the United States. You would want to be in Bureau Park. You'd want to be here. And this is true all over the world with these awesome places just like this. And so it's really cool. I wish, every, I, wish I could bring the entire class here for a day and just see how awesome it is in a place like Bogota. And of course, you want to be here. You know, so... Anyway, we'll get back to that when we do something on, uh, so when we talk about immigration. But for the meantime, though, hey, can everyone give a hand to DJ for coming? Oh, thanks. Right? Yeah. Thanks. So, and have a great have break. Have a great break. Be safe. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay. Oh, hey, here's an announcement, by the way. Uh, no, never mind. I'll send an email out. Be well. Take care, everybody. See you, DJ. See you, Jeff. Stream team, thanks for everything. Nice job.